Thank you, Eric, choir. If you would, please turn with me to 2 Timothy, the first chapter, verses 3 through 7. We are going to read together that passage and then speak about spiritual gifts for a few minutes. If you would, please stand with me as we read together. Beginning in verse 3, I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and, of, and love and of self-discipline. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. The summer after my ninth grade year, I surrendered to the ministry in my little West Texas uh, church. Went off to college and then went to attend the largest seminary in the world at the time, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. It had well over 4,000 students. As I arrived, I went to class in my blue jeans and my tennis shoes. I said I was from West Texas. And as I was in that crowded hall, I saw all around me a sea of three-piece suits and briefcases. I didn't even have a briefcase. And preacher talk that was unlike anything I'd ever t heard before. And I was a little bit uncomfortable with it. And I began to feel very out of place. In some way, I didn't fit in this situation. And so I actually went to a bookstore. I bought the LSAT material. I was going to study for law school. I never doubted my calling. I just began to wonder if I was going in the right direction with it. By the grace of God, I didn't leave the seminary. What happened was I, I found some people like me who were wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes to their classes. And then I also discovered something about myself, talking with my wife and with my friends and some self-reflection. I began to understand that I'm me, and God chose me in my own unique personality and all my quirks and everything about me, and then he gifted me, and that I would be able to fit some, some positions or places of ministry that no one else would be able to fit in the same way, and that God had called me intentionally. That, that crisis ended well for me, and I came through that. But I think I'm not the only one who goes through those crises. I think other ministers have seen that same thing, where they began to wonder if they didn't feel, uh, didn't fit right or whatever. I also think that individual believers, every person in this room, when you became a believer, God deposited His Holy Spirit in you, and then He gave you spiritual gifts. You may not be even aware of what those are or all of them, but you have a spiritual gift. And either by personality or by some event that occurs, you begin to feel like maybe I don't fit, I can't really use my gift, I'm not like those people, and so we begin to retreat. And from time to time, maybe we need a word of encouragement from God's Word, and that's why I have selected this passage this morning. Paul is writing from prison. It's his second letter to Timothy. He's back in prison, and he writes to Timothy uh, to, to encourage him, pretty strongly, by the way. Now, he starts his passage by reminding himself of some things. He's reminded uh, of Timothy's friendship uh, and how close they were. He's reminded of Timothy's faith and how deep that heritage is for his grandmother and his mother. And he's reminded of the tears that were shed the last time they were together. And he wants to see Timothy again. And then we get to verse 6 and he says, For this reason. Now when you have that statement, you're asking, okay, what reason? And you begin to look up and it's probably all of the above. Paul is saying, because I know you so well and we're such good friends, I feel like I can say this to you. Because your heritage of faith is so strong, I feel like I need to tell you to keep going and to encourage you on to do that. 
There are several reasons, but what Paul does in verse 6 is he's going to turn and he's going to give Timothy a very pointed, very strong encouragement, a push to use his gifts and to do the things that he needs to do. Now, all of us have those gifts, spiritual gifts. They're not the same gifts. The person next to you doesn't have perhaps the same gift as you do, but you have it. And from, some, from, from time to time, we need to be just reminded that we need to use those gifts and get that little push. And so I want us to look at the text today and find out what it is that Paul said to Timothy and therefore what it is that the Word of God says to us about our own gifts, our own work, our own ministry here in this church. The first thing I want you to note is this. Paul will say to Timothy, make sure you never allow your God-given gifts to grow cold. That would be the same thing for us. I am a big fan of coffee. And if you know me, you know that, that I drink several cups. But you need to understand, too, I have some certain quirks about coffee. I, I like dark roast coffee. But I also do not drink lukewarm coffee. If I get a cup of coffee and it's set on my desk for 10 minutes, I'm pouring it out. I know that's wasteful, but I just cannot drink that. And also, I've been known to throw away coffee makers that do not make hot coffee. To me, coffee loses its effectiveness as, co as coffee if it's not hot. I want it that way. That is exactly what Paul is saying about spiritual gifts. Unless they are flaming hot, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you, he says to Timothy. Fanning into flame gives you the impression that uh, there is a fire, that it's not out, but it's going down and you still see the glowing embers, and that's that idea. It's not talking about his faith. It's talking about his spiritual gifts. And if those spiritual gifts begin to get cold and are unused, then they become ineffective. And so Paul says, you need to fan that. You, we've all had that. You put a new log on there. You get down and you fan it or you blow on it. And those embers begin to catch fire. And then the flame comes back. And that's what he's saying. Fan into flame that gift. He's saying use that gift. He's saying make the most of that gift that God has given to you. Now, the gift of God that he's talking about is a reference to the spiritual gift package that Timothy had. And by the way, Timothy is very different from Paul. They're two different people. We're not even sure all of the reasons Paul is giving him this instruction. It is perhaps because Timothy is different. There are some who believe Timothy was a little shyer than Paul, maybe a little more reluctant, not as much out there. And Paul is having to give him that little push at this point. Sometimes we need that little push as well. We're not exactly sure of the context here, but we do know that Paul says, you've got a set of gifts, and they're very much like he was a pastor, so probably has a gift of preaching, gift of teaching, maybe a gift of leadership, maybe a gift of evangelism. We're not sure exactly what his gifts were, but what Paul says is fan into flame those gifts, use those gifts, make the most of those gifts. Then he says, which is in you. And I want to really camp here for just a second. I think this pulls it all together. Fan and to fame the gift of God which is in you, Timothy. Now, Timothy is not Paul. He's his own unique person. God created Timothy that way. There are no more Timothys in the world. There never will be any more Timothys in the world. He was the one and only like him. And then God deposited spiritual gifts in him. And that made Timothy a unique package. And every time that Timothy goes to a church, he will exercise and express those gifts in a different way than Paul would. That's what I discovered in seminary. I was the only, of all of those 4,000 plus students, I'm the only Terry Carter there. And God called me, Terry Carter, to be there. And he gifted me. And I may have had similar gifts to the people around me, but I'm the only one who can use them in the way that God wants me to use them. And I will fit some situations that no one else will fit in quite the same way. That is exactly true for you. The Scripture says that every one of you has been gifted. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Paul says it in this way. 
to each one has been given the gift. And then in 1 Peter 4.10, it says, whatever gift you have been given, it assumes you have one, that you are to use it faithfully for God. We know that the, that the Scripture says that every time a person becomes a believer, not only does he receive the Spirit of God who dwells in him, but he receives spiritual gifts that are to be used in the church. And that makes you, since you are created uniquely, individually, just like God wanted you to be, and nobody else in this room is like you, that makes you a unique package. You can use that gift like nobody else can use it. Only you can do it that way because God created you that way. We need people to fan and to flame the gifts just as Paul was telling Timothy. This is the time that we need to do that, that gift which is in you. Now, here's what happens. Sometimes when we don't know what our gift is or we do and we're not comfortable with it, we become self-critical. We begin to say, well, I'm not like that person. I can't teach like that person. I'm not quite the same as that person, which is absolutely correct. You are unique. But we become self-critical and we retreat on that gift, just like maybe Timothy was doing. Sometimes we have a gift and we know what they are and we become critical of other people. Well, their gift's not quite as good as mine. But in both of those, we miss that uniqueness that God intended us to be in the body of believers. Now, listen up, because I'm going to confess a sin here. While I was in seminary, I took preaching. And in the preaching class, we had a lab, and the camera was on. And I had to preach in front of the camera, the professor, and all of the students who were critiquing me. And everybody else did. And as I was critiquing one of the students there... I listened to him. His grammar was atrocious. His West Texas slang was horrible. He was further in West Texas than I was. And I judged him. I, may, I sinned in that moment. I said, there's no way this guy has the gift of preaching. There's no place he can be used. After I graduated from seminary, I went to be a BSU director, a student minister on a campus. Some of you know what a Baptist Student Union was. And associations all around me were supporting my ministry and every year I had to go to their associational meetings and then say here's what we're doing so they'll know where their money's being used. I drove further than I'd ever driven before to a rural county to the county seat First Baptist Church and it was just ranchers in the area. I walked into that church and guess who greeted me? You already figured it out. Still with the same atrocious grammar Still with the same slang, but everybody in his church spoke the same way. And this guy fit it like a glove. He loved them. They loved him. The church was flourishing. Everything was going. And in humility, I had to confess I was wrong. God created that man in his own particular way and then gifted him. And he could use those gifts in a way that I would never fit. I could not have fit into that church like him. I was a missionary in Germany. I don't know that he would have fit there. But God has designed the church that way. Helmut Tielke puts it this way. He says, each of us is a dab of paint on God's palette. Then he is painting this great masterpiece, this wonderful painting, this picture. And you are an important piece, a dab. Different colors, different sizes, different shapes. But that dab of paint needs to be there. And everyone who is a part of the body of Christ has to use their gifts. Paul put it this way in Ephesians 4.16. As each part does its part, the church builds itself up in love. But if each part doesn't do its part, then we are not getting in the church what we need. The ministry and the care. God has designed you to use your gift. And you alone can use it in your way. Nobody else can do it just the way you do. Now, you could have read verse 6, and Timothy might have said, Okay, but I can't do that. How do I use those gifts? And we could say the same. It's really easy, a person who's been gifted by God, to say, I, I just can't use that gift uh, like somebody else can. And so we begin to retreat. 
But the second thing that Paul's going to say to Timothy is, God's not going to give you a gift and not give you the ability to use the gift. So that brings us to the second truth that I want us to learn. Remember God has given you all the equipment, everything you need to use your gifts effectively. When you get into the passage now, verse 7, he's going to say, Not only do you fan into flame the gift that you have, but Timothy, God did not give you a spirit of timidity. Now, if you look at the passage, verse 7, spirit's used twice there. They're both usually, if you're looking at your Bible, lowercase s's. And scholars then have argued, is this a spirit, as Gordon Fee says, like an attitude of timidity, an attitude of reluctance that Timothy has, and it can mean that. Or is it the Holy Spirit that God has given to you? And I think really it's a little of both. You have an attitude that you need to to take into your ministry, but God then empowers you to change you. We are transformed in that. And he says, Timothy, you do not have a spirit of timidity in you. The word timidity is a pretty strong word. It can mean uh, even cowardice. But it means to run from something that is difficult. It means to have a sense of inferiority. It is that sense that I can't do this. And maybe Timothy was facing some opposition and he was backing away. We don't know why. But Paul says, you don't have that kind of spirit. You have a spirit that equips you to do whatever God wants you, to ha- wants you to do. First, you have a spirit of power, he says. The spirit of power energizes you. It pushes you. It gives you the strength to use your gift. And that's critical. You cannot use the spiritual gift God has given you under your own power effectively. I tell my preachers that all the time. You can prepare a great sermon. You can get up and get ready to do it. But if it's not through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is an ineffective use of the gift. Power is essential, and that comes from God in order to use our gifts. Before serving here, I was interim in in Camden, Arkansas. Great people in Camden, Arkansas. But if you drive into Camden, and I don't want to offend anybody, but as you drive in, you might say, what does Camden have to offer? And you would be wrong if you think nothing. You go out to their industrial park, and you find that there's Lockheed and Aerojet and Spectre and General Dynamics, and wow, it's one of the tech centers of Arkansas. And they build missiles And one company builds the shell, one company builds the warhead, one company builds the motor, another company builds the guidance system, somebody else puts the fuel in. We were out eating with one of the engineers one day. Their company made the solid crystal fuel. And as we were sitting there, we were talking about this because this interested me. And then he leaned over jokingly and said, but you know, without our fuel, that rocket is just a shell that can do nothing. And I thought of that when I was looking at this passage. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in us, without God's power, all of the gifts, all of our abilities, all of our talents, they're just shells. They really can't do what we need to do in ministry. It is the power of God that we depend on. And then he says, by the way, you have a spirit of love. Love's important. Spiritual gifts used without love can sometimes be used to browbeat and to really hurt people. That's never the way they're intended. Spiritual gifts with love, it softens it. It gives it the heart. It truly then ministers to people. And Timothy, he's saying, here's how you can do that. You have experienced the love of Christ, and now you can use your gifts to share the love of Christ with other people. That is the way it's supposed to happen. And then he says the spirit of discipline. That word can mean self-discipline, it can mean self-control, it can mean the ability to think, it can mean also the ability to behave properly. Here, let me put it all together for you. I think that's what he's saying. Timothy, you came from a great home, and your parent, your mother, and your grandmother passed the faith down. And when you received that faith, you received the Holy Spirit. And then God gave you these wonderful gifts, and he gives you the power to use them, and the love to infuse them with the heart that is needed So go behave as you should. Use that gift. Fan into flame those gifts that are so critical to be used in the church. Altogether, 
we have what it takes to use our gifts. And every person in here, Paul described the body, the church as a body of believers, where every member is different, but that's what makes it all work. We all come together, we use our gifts, and that's the way it works. We're all those little dabs that Teleki said. And every one of us is needed to do our part. And we can. And it can keep you at the task if you use the equipment God has called you to. I spent most of my academic career working on, with one guy, William Carey. He's called the father of the modern mission movement. I've written several articles and books on, that, on William Carey. And, and uh, William Carey uh, f- uh, helped found the Baptist Missionary Society, became one of its first missionaries. But from the start, it was as hard as it could be. He was given a gift, a spiritual gift, I believe, of languages, the ability to be a linguist. Twenty-seven different portions or full Bibles came out because of Carey's work for all kinds of people in the area where he was in India. Now, Carey went out. He took a wife who didn't want to go, and that was miserable. And as soon as they got there, the guy who was supposed to handle the money did a poor job, and they had no money. And then he went out into the wilderness to try to make it on his own, and his son caught a fever, his youngest, and he died. And then his wife uh, really kind of emotionally went off the deep end with that and tried to kill him. And then she, she passed away, and he buried her. And then he lost some grandchildren there. And then he buried another wife, and he had a son go prodigal and he had accidents that almost killed him and the doctor said you need to go home because this climate is killing you and then his own mission society turned away from him but he stayed the whole time why because he knew that God had given him the gifts and he had the power to use them and he loved the people of India with all of his heart And stayed all the way to the end. And he had the self-discipline to stay with it. And every single one of us has exactly the same thing. A gift with all the equipment to use it. Now, the church only functions properly if everybody steps up and uses their gift and does their part. Every body of believers in every location. I believe God has put the people in there to do what needs to be done. And yet, right now, there are some very critical needs at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Some needs that really, not for next fall, when we start our church year, right now, we need children, preschool teachers, Sunday school teachers. We need middle school Sunday school teachers. We need young adult adult Sunday school teachers. We need Wednesday night zone kids leaders. We need hospitality people to help at the doors and to drive the carts and to be out in the parking lot and to be hosts and hostesses. And there are some people in this church who have the gifts for that. Gifts of mercy, gifts of encouragement, whatever they are. And we need those people to step up and be their part and do their part. Only as each part does its part will the church grow itself up in love. My favorite Aesop's fable is the mice and the cat. The cat is giving the mice a lot of problems, sneaking up on them. They don't know he's there. And then the mice decide to get together and have a meeting. Probably they're Baptist, there's food there. And one of the little mouse, uh, uh, mice, uh, a little mouse says, Listen, I've got an idea. We need to put a bell on that cat, and then we'll hear him coming. He'll never be able to get up, sneak up on us. And one of the older mice says to them, I think it's a great idea, but who's going to bell the cat? God's plan for the church is a wonderful, beautiful plan. It's a great idea. The body is diverse with everyone being given gifts, and all together they make one complete body that ministers the way it should. But every part has to do its part. So the question becomes, who's going to bail the cat? Who's going to say, I can do that one? I will fill that role. I'm gifted there, and God will empower me to use my gift. The church 
depends on every part functioning as God intended it to function. As we look at this, it's possible that there's somebody in the room today who realizes, all right, I I need to do something. I need to become more active. And God has gifted me in this way, and I've been reluctant, but now's the time to step up. Could be that there's somebody who needs to join a church, and you think, "I, I can be a part of this church. I can serve in this church, and God is calling you to be there. It's also possible that there's somebody in the room today who realizes I'm really not part of the church because I've never received the Holy Spirit that's transformed my life through Jesus Christ. That can happen today. In a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I'll be standing here to greet you and to pray with you. Other staff will be here. This is the time to answer the Spirit's call on your life and to do what God is calling you to do. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful that you saved me, that you deposited your spirit in me, and that you gifted me. And Father, that you're allowing me the opportunity to use my gifts. I pray, Father, that if there's one in the room here today who realizes they really need to take a more active role, that they would begin to do what you've called them to do, whatever that ministry is. If there's one in the room who does not have a church home and they feel like this is the place, then we pray, Lord, that this would be the day that they would join this church. And, Father, we pray for those who do not know you as personal Savior. May today be the day of salvation for them, that they will come to know you as personal Savior through faith, and that this will change their life forevermore. We pray these things in your Son's name. Amen.